Hi, everyone. Since we're not meeting in class on Wednesday, March 6th, I wanted to just uh, make this brief video for you to um, push us a little further in our uh, understanding and conversation about ancient Greek art so that we can pick up next week on Monday, March 11th, looking at the classical period. So um, between the where we left off and the classical period, there's a couple of really important developments that I want us to, uh, to take a look at. Uh, but just to review where we left off on Monday in class, we were looking at vase paintings from the archaic period when class ended. Uh, and remember, we see these two particular vases, both by named artists, Exekius is the artist who both crafted and decorated uh, the vase on the left, and Euphronius is the artist who designed the decorations of this calyx crater that we see on the right. And you'll notice that there's probably only about, you know, 30 years or so between these two vases, and yet there is a major development that has occurred uh, between about 15, uh, excuse me, 540 BC and 515 BC. Namely, Exekius is using uh, the black figure painting technique. You can see that the figures of uh, Achilles and Ajax on the central portion of the vase have been painted in black slip, which Exekius has then used a kind of needle to engrave or etch into to reveal uh, the, the sort of uh, yellow or orangish color of the, the actual terracotta underneath to provide all of the details in the clothing and in the uh, hair, the eyes, the face facial features, the musculature of those two figures. So it has a kind of linear quality or a sort of patterned, almost calligraphic quality, uh, even as it achieves a much, much greater naturalism than what we might have seen, say, in the geometric period from the, the previous uh, couple of hundred years. Notice that Euphronius has sort of reversed or um, inverted that um, organization of uh, pictorial uh, and tonal color. So instead of painting the figures black and then um, etching or engraving details into them, what he has done is actually painted the background black and left the, the space of the figures as what we might think of as negative space, but we now read it as positive space. We call this the red figure technique. Uh, and at the end of class, we were talking about why that might be an advantageous uh, way to rethink the painting of these figures on vases. Um, how it shows a kind of progression in the way artists were thinking about their their craft. Uh, particularly you can see, I think, in this uh, Death of Sarpedon vase that Euphronius is able to create much greater detail, much greater range of tonality by using these very, very fine lines and sometimes much thicker lines um, of black paint that he's freely able to apply within the sort of um, outline, the sort of yellow or orangish tone of each of the figures, so that there's a kind of um, a, a level of perhaps uh, visual and pictorial sophistication that's possible with the red figure vase that is really much, much more difficult to achieve in the black figure vase. And even in just this one example, I think we can see the way that Greek artists were trying, striving constantly for more and more progress, for greater and greater perfection of their craft and their technique. Uh, one of the other things I think that's important to note about both of these vases is the subject matter that we're looking at. So we noted with Exekius's painting of Achilles and Ajax that these were heroes of the Trojan War, very much human figures uh, who lead to very human fates. So here they're shown um, in a very everyday kind of um, playful uh, pastime of a board game. Uh, however, this is taking place in the midst of the Trojan War, and we know, or any Greek citizen certainly would have known, uh, that right after this kind of moment of rest and relaxation, that both of these uh, Greek heroes were going to go out into the battlefield and Achilles was going to lose his life. Ajax later uh, would actually commit suicide as well. That's the subject of another um, vase painting that is uh, very, very uh, sort of moving and um, dramatic. So in fact, uh, any, anyone looking at this vase in 540 BCE would certainly have known that premonition of the story yet to come uh, and the sort of pathos, the human drama that is being uh, portrayed here in this moment right before that uh, terrible tragedy. Uh, in a similar way, we can see the death of Sarpedon. This is another military uh, sort of or warrior type, a human figure. Uh, and here you can see him interacting with the gods. Hypnos and Thanatos are carrying him off, af, off of the battlefield after he's been uh, killed in battle. And you can see Hermes there uh, standing behind him with his arm raised, uh, ready to sort of um, carry him on um, into, into the afterworld.
And this is interesting because it really does show us a very specific example of the way that uh, the Greeks understood humans and gods to really interact, to intermingle in a way, and that they treated gods very much like humans. If you look at Thanatos uh, and Hypnos, the two figures who are carrying the dead Sarpedon, they look very much like warriors themselves, um, minus the wings, of course, <laughs> a little uh, godly addition there. Uh, and you can see that they, uh, in fact, have very much the same profile as the two warriors who are standing with shields and spears right behind them at the two very far edges of the, um, of the pictorial space. So uh, there is that sort of sense of the way in which gods in ancient Greece really intervene in human affairs and human history, that they take an active interest in human affairs, um, and, um, and that they, in fact, are treated kind of like humans in a lot of ways. We talked about that in terms of the way that gods conduct themselves uh, in ancient Greece, uh, not very much like humans. Now, just to note, and I, I noted this at the end of class um, on Monday, this kind of crater, this calyx crater, was very much the type that was used uh, as a kind of punch bowl or wine bowl uh, for mixing wine and water that would be drunk during uh, symposia. That is to say, these kind of uh, very um, erudite drinking parties that elite members of uh, Greek society would take part in. Um, and I just want to show you another example of a, a vase or a, a vessel that was used in these symposia. This is um, uh, known as a kylix, which is the type of vase that was used, or the vessel that was used for drinking wine at symposia. And I think it's really also worth noting here that these two were decorated very um, elaborately. You can see that there are decorations painted both on the interior that you would sort of reveal slowly as you drank your wine, uh, and that there were also decorations running around the exterior of the vessel. If we look at that vessel more clearly, you can see that that interior figure is one uh, of a, a togged uh, man carrying a lute. So this is very likely the kind of musical accompaniment that would have taken place or have been part of the symposium. Uh, and then likewise, you can see in the exterior that you have figures of athletes, nude figures of athletes uh, who are in the midst of their training regimen, you might say. And there are, are also these the figures of the trainers here with their, their sticks who are helping these, uh, these young men to reach the, the perfect athletic competitiveness. Uh, others have already completed their, their um, exercise for the day. You can see that they're re themselves. So it's really interesting to keep in mind why these kinds of decorations might be used on a drinking vessel as part of a, a drinking um, symposium or drinking party, uh, because it's, it does, it seems to me, suggest the kinds of associations or values that you might expect in ancient Greece amongst, of course, this elite level of, of citizenry, male citizenry. So music, wine, but also athletic prowess, physical strength and beauty, all of this is part of the kind of um, ethos or mentality within this uh, particular culture. Now we also have images that show us these kinds of vessels in action. So here you can see uh, some um, images from the tomb of the diver. The, this is, this uh, tomb was found in Paestum, which is one of the Greek colonies that was located actually in what we would now think of as the Italian peninsula. You can see a reconstruction of it up here on the, uh, the right-hand corner. It was fairly um, tight, but there would have been a young man who was buried in this, in this particular tomb, and it's very, very decorated on the interior with uh, this kind of frescoed wall painting. We saw this image of the diver right at the beginning of class when we were doing our little formal analysis stuff, uh, but you can see that that's part of a larger program here of imagery. And here's a, an image that I think actually shows us some of those vessels in action. You'll see that you can see those kylix, those, those um, vessels that are used for drinking in action here as these young men and older men are reclining on these um, uh, benches or uh, beds as part of a symposium. You can see the kinds of activities perhaps that were part of this symposium. Uh, drinking, uh, making music, you can see this figure here has a lyre. Uh, we have older men who are bearded with young, paired with younger men who are, are uh, clean shaven. Same over here, uh, and they seem to be making toasts, throwing wine at each other, which apparently was a thing. Uh, and you can also see this larger uh, vessel over here. So this would have been maybe that calyx um, um, vase that we saw just a moment ago. 
Uh, and it's interesting to think about uh, what we can see here, because as, as I said, this decorates the interior of a tomb for a young man with these uh, fairly elaborate frescoes, or wall paintings. Perhaps this represents a funerary feast of some kind, uh, a sort of party on behalf of the, the dead youth. Uh, but it certainly um, would suggest a kind of aristocratic gathering of some sort. Uh, and this sort of realigns perhaps our understanding or our interpretation of this particular scene of the young diver. Uh, perhaps rather than simply being a scene from everyday life, this might have a symbolic overtone of this young man um, diving into the unknown of uh, life after death. Um, but very much, in, as we mentioned at the very beginning of class, with this kind of organic imagery that um, is sort of complemented or, or uh, sort of contrasted with the geometry of the diving board from which he is springing. Um, so just interesting to see these vases in action. Now I'd like to, um, there you can see the entire, uh, entirety of that um, upper fresco, and it's interesting also to keep in mind that this would have been above where the remains of the young man would have been interred here. So if you think of that figure uh, looking, quote unquote, looking up at the diver, uh, you can get a sense of how that resonance of, of diving into the afterlife might have, might have read in that context. So I want to look now at um, another sort of important development in the archaic period. That is the development of these uh, monumental freestanding sculptures, primarily carved out of marble, which is a relatively soft and easy material to, um, to manipulate. Um, they often, as you can see in this case, uh, showcase young men. This is called the Met Kouros because it is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, it's called a Kouros. That's a general word that indicates a youth or young man. Uh, we see that over and over again. These are just general Kouros figures. Usually, just as we saw with the vases, these um, freestanding sculptures represent nude athletes, as probably we see in this case sometimes also warriors or heroes of, of um, battles, sometimes also gods, but again, when it's gods, it's usually in the context or in relationship to humans and human activities. And that's, again, really interesting, exactly the same thing we saw with vases. So this, I mean, is really uh, important to keep in mind that these uh, this new kind of uh, development artistically is taking place in this so-called archaic period. Um, you can see the size. It's slightly larger than life, most likely. It's just over six feet tall. It's actually quite imposing when you see it in person. Uh, and you can see that it's essentially a nude figure. These kinds of freestanding sculptures tended to be used either as markers for graves, just as we saw with that large funerary crater from the geometric period, uh, and sometimes also they were placed in sanctuaries or temples uh, perhaps as part of the sort of religious rites and festivals that might be taking place in a particular uh, temple space. And often those temples were also closely related to theaters and to um, locations for athletic competitions and games. So all of these things were intertwined in Greek culture. Now, there are, I think, a number of things to note about this, but let's start by comparing it to, say, the standing figure of Menkaure uh, and his queen, perhaps Cameron Nebdi II. Just take a minute, do you see similarities? I mean, for me, the thing that, that sort of stands out is that their stance is so similar, right? They're standing completely upright, arms at their sides, sort of pinned to the si outsides of their thighs. Uh, their posture is totally perfect. Their heads are straight forward. Their gaze seems to be uh, off into the distance. Um, they're, even the stance of their legs with one foot forward, the other behind, seems to be almost identical. Um, it's also, to me, striking that they have a similarly kind of almost abstract quality or ideal quality. Uh, there's a kind of geometry you can see in this figure of the Met Kouros. Look at these sort of straight lines for the abdominal muscles. Look at the almost kind of geometric shape that is given to the kneecaps. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's very similar to what we see over here with those square kneecaps that we see in the figures of both Menkaure and Camerunebti. Likewise, uh, the shapes used for the eyes are these kinds of very um, abstracted almond shapes. Uh, the patterning of the hair is very much a kind of um, linear uh, decorative kind of pattern here. So while we might say that this is a very naturalistic figure, uh, there are a lot of parallels to the kind of abstracted idealism that we might have seen in ancient Egypt from the stance 
to the, the gaze, to the clenched fists, to the position of the feet, uh, to some of the details of the body. But at the same time, I think there's some differences. I think we would know right off the bat that the Matkuros was not uh, the work of an ancient Egyptian artist. And it didn't, wouldn't have functioned in ancient Egyptian society. How come? Well, first, the first thing I notice, of course, is that we know that Menkare is a pharaoh, right? Because he's wearing his kilt, he's wearing his false beard, he's wearing his Nini's headdress. He's got all the attributes that identify him as a pharaoh. Whereas our Matkuros, because he's completely nude, doesn't have any of those kind of defining characteristics or attributes that would tell us anything about his identity or his social status, his political role, anything like that. So in that sense, he seems to be freed from the kinds of um, expectations that you might immediately have of an ancient Egyptian figure. He's also, as far as I can tell, a little slimmer, and sort of a little more lithe, perhaps, maybe a little more athletic, um, a little bit younger, perhaps, he looks very youthful. Um, perhaps reflecting the kinds of ideals of, of ancient Greece more specifically. And I think for me, the most important thing is that um, if you notice, the Met Kouros is actually completely free from the stone. So he's actually truly freestanding. His hands still do sort of connect to his thighs with a little extra stone material here, of the marble, uh, but in between his legs, cut free. In between his arms and the side of his waist, cut free. So you can literally sort of see through uh, and around this figure in a way that you really can't with Menkaure, right? He's still very much attached to that stone, it becomes part of the block of that stone. So for me, this truly freestanding figure it gives a completely different impression. Uh, there's a sense that even though he seems kind of stiff and rigid and very upright in his position, he's also at the same time a little freer, a little more agile, perhaps. And again, that I think is reflective of the different purposes uh, to which these sculptures were put and the different values of their societies. Um, it's also the case that, um, to get back to Ed's point in, uh, or question on Monday, uh, that there were images of women that were created uh, during the same period of the archaic uh, era uh, in freestanding sculptures. Uh, so this is known as a kore or a youthful maiden as opposed to the kuros, which is the youthful male figure. This one is known as the peplos kore because she's wearing this elaborate woolen garment, which was known as a peplos. Uh, and this figure, which is about four feet tall, um, uh, was actually found um, in one of the sanctuaries on the Acropolis, which is the main sort of religious center uh, in the city of Athens. So uh, clearly had some kind of religious role as a sort of um, handmaiden or attendant in one of these uh, sort of temple com complexes. You can see that the figure has been damaged over time. She originally had an outstretched arm, which um, has become detached here, sort of at the elbow or so. Uh, and that's also really interesting because it's uh, a way in which this figure was uh, sort of expanded beyond the block of stone. So to have those arms and extremities moving out from the body is already a kind of major development, I think, in uh, the treatment of the, the standing figure. Um, she likely held forth some kind of libations or offering or something in that in that hand that is now or an arm that has been broken off. Uh, but it's really interesting because you can see that there's a kind of way in which uh, this figure, uh, despite again that sort of upright and maybe sort of rigid stance, seems kind of engaged and engaging. Certainly, that uh, outstretched arm would have been part of that. But look also at her face, her expression. She's got this sort of funny little smile uh, that sort of just picks up the corners of her mouth. This is known as the archaic smile. Uh, it's, a, it's a term that's given to that kind of enigmatic expression that we often see in figures uh, carved from this period that suggests some kind of psychological presence, like some kind of thinking going on in her head, uh, uh, so that it's not just that kind of blank a permanent everlasting stare that we often encountered in ancient Egypt, for example. But there's a real sense that there's a person in there and a, a, a thinking or a feeling person uh, inside this sculpted stone. Uh, one other thing you might notice about this is that there are lots of sort of rev remnants of red paint on her hair, on parts of her dress. In fact, 
almost all of these Greek um, uh, freestanding sculptures that we see were originally painted, sometimes in really garish, bright colors that we might not think of uh, as particularly sort of uh, beautiful or uh, sort of complementary now, uh, but certainly would have made these uh, sculptures incredibly sort of vibrant. Uh, the remnants are all we have now, but the, the, there's a chemical uh, ways to do a chemical analysis of these pigments to know exactly how bright and vivid they would have been originally. Um, it's just a completely different way of thinking about these, essentially what now look like white marble statues, as uh, attempting to achieve a kind of vibrancy, a kind of life, perhaps even a kind of naturalism by painting the skin tone, by painting the hair or the eyeballs, as you can see here, to give them that sense of, of living figures. Um, it's also, and this is true with also with the, the Met Kouros that we just saw and many of the other sculptures we'll see also on architectural uh, structures as well. Interesting here for the core figure, the maidens as opposed to the youthful male figures, that there's a different kind of challenge that the uh, sculptors had to uh, attend to here. Uh, male figures were often shown nude. Again, this is related to their athletic athleticism and their competitive uh, sort of uh, virile strength. Um, women were never shown in the nude in the same way. They didn't take part in those kinds of athletic competitions, nor was it a kind of virtue for them to uh, achieve that same kind of physical prowess. Uh, when they were out in public, they were often um, uh, heavily clothed, their faces and heads often uh, covered, certainly their hair to be as inconspicuous as possible. Uh, but uh, there were certain ways in which women had important roles to play, particularly in those sanctuaries and those temples, including off making offerings to gods and goddesses. Um, and in that sense, you can see there's uh, a way in which the artist has to uh, conform to the expectations of a female figure as opposed to a male figure, can't show her in the nude. So how do you suggest that vitality, that sort of um, physical uh, presence in a figure that is clothed? Well, it's interesting. You can see there are, there are nonetheless ways that this artist has attempted to give a sense of the physicality of the form. Look at the, the cinch of the waist of the dress that she's wearing. You can almost see the sort of way in which the flesh begins to um, bulge out around it, both around the hips, which are very thin and narrow, but also up through the stomach and the waist. Certainly you can see the sort of uh, uh, protrusions of her breasts, again, damage there because of the protrusions would have uh, been subject to abrasion there. And then lovely details like this. Look at the way that the, uh, the cloth of that upper part of her robe uh, seems to sort of swirl around her arm in this very natural way, giving it that kind of fold and that kind of uh, natural fall of the, of the material over, her, over the flesh of her arm. So uh, definitely a different challenge, but another way to uh, try to present or suggest that believable body underneath that dress, which is relatively confining. Okay, let's take a look at what happens, because remember we talked about how Greek art progresses very quickly. So here we are from 600 BCE with the Met Kouros to about 400, uh, 475 BCE, we meet the Critios boy. Now this was another sculpture that was found on the Acropolis in Athens, that, that big sanctuary uh, and religious center of the city of, of Athens. What has happened? What has happened to the human ideal? What has happened to the representation of human form in just these 125 years? Well, for starters, that sort of incredible rigid frontality, I think, has, has sort of been softened now. There's a kind of natural um, lifelike ease to the pose of the Critios boy here. Uh, he's got a slight turn to his body and to his neck and head. There's a, a sense that he, again, has maybe something of that archaic smile going on. You can see that he has sort of little holes where his eyes would have been. In fact, these probably would have been filled with precious stones or other minerals to give you the sense of, of eyeballs really sort of looking at you. Again, this figure too would have been painted and you can see some remnants of that coloration in his hair and a little bit on his face as well. So uh, definitely a, a new sort of ease, a new kind of grace with the turn of the body. Um, even with his missing arms and lower extremities of legs and feet, you can get the sense that this is a much more casual stance, a much more natural stance, I would say. In fact, we could call this the beginning of what we might call contrapposto, 
I don't know if you've ever heard this term before. Uh, oh, and I spelled it wrong. There should be an R in there. My apologies. So contra against posto position. So you can really see that he's, instead of equally distributing the weight on his two legs between his two feet, here in the Critios boy, even without um, having those feet, you can see that he probably has more weight on that back leg. How do we know? Well, this knee is bent and upright, it's a little bit more uh, uh, upward. Uh, notice also the shift in the hips. So this hip is much higher, suggesting that this one is relaxed, falling downward. And it's interesting because that movement of the hips, that shifting of the weight to want more towards one leg than the other, actually has ramifications and impacts throughout the whole rest of the posture. So you can see uh, that the midline of the body, even if it stays moderately straight, uh, will affect the sort of level of the shoulders, the twist of the shoulders, the twist of the head. Uh, so that that sort of gentle curvature, that easy lifelikeness comes or stems from that, that sort of shift in weight right at the base of the figure. In addition, I think you can really see that there's a new attention to anatomical detail and a kind of organic quality to the musculature and the sort of bone structure here. Instead of these kind of abstract or almost geometric lines and forms that we see inscribed on the surface of the Metcuros's body, look at this sort of uh, incredible sophistication with which the rib cage here is suggested or the shoulder blades, the um, collar bones. There's a real uh, sort of attention to naturalism here and trying to capture those effects. Uh, of course, our, our barometer here of the kneecaps, these look much more integrated into the sort of uh, bone structure of the body as opposed to being sort of these blocky uh, geometric structures that seem to um, only uh, point to rather than actually represent the bones of the body or the interior of the body. So that we really get a sense of the sort of inner working of, of the whole structure. So because the structure seems more carefully defined, that contrapposto, that sort of uh, shifting of weight becomes much more believable as well. Now, this leads us to perhaps its inevitable perfection in a figure like this that we see here on the right. This is known as the Deriferous, the spear bearer. Um, he's no longer carrying his spear, but you can see he has his arm raised here, uh, which likely originally held a spear. The other hand's very relaxed at his side. By this time, we have moved into the classical period. So our Metkuros and our Critios boy are still from the archaic period. Uh, and here we can see the sort of um, beginning of the classical period. The Deriferous is really an important um, figure. Again, we have a named artist. Polykleitos, um, who probably made the original Deriferous or spear bearer figure around 450 or 440 BCE. It's very large, over six feet tall, sort of larger than life. What we have now, what has come down to us, is a Roman copy. So the Romans, as we will see, were incredibly enthralled with Greek culture and made a absolutely um, impeccable, very, very accurate rep uh, reproductions of Greek sculptures uh, that they found. Uh, in, most likely Polykleitos' original sculpture was made of bronze, and we'll see some examples of what the, that looks like uh, in just a moment. But using this um, uh, Roman copy in marble, we can really get a sense of what classical sculpture was like and what Polykleitos was trying to achieve. So again, we see that contrapposto in place now, I think, even more clearly than ever. So you can see that that standing leg is bearing almost all of the weight. The other one is just barely touching down with the toes of the, what is that, his left foot. Uh, that shifting of the weight results in this rising of the hip, falling of the, of the relaxed hip, and notice how it uh, really begins to shift the entire body. There's almost this curve through the midline of the body. Notice also the kind of balance that Polykleitos achieves. So if we have an active standing leg on this side, the, as we look at the figure on our left, notice that the active arm is opposite that, right? So the active arm is to the right as we look at the figure. Likewise, the relaxed leg to our right is paired with a relaxed arm to our left. So that there's a kind of, you might say, a kind of X form through the body, uh, a balance between uh, the active and the relaxed uh, limbs of the, of the body. 
all of that then culminates in this now very pronounced shift in the head, movement of the head to look to the uh, over, away from us, uh, to the to our left. Now this is really interesting because I think what it does is not only make the posture a little bit more believable and more lifelike, but it also seems to put this figure into space and time in a way, right? Because he's looking out into the distance, but now seems to be looking at something specific. It's not like the thousand yard stare that we see with somebody like Khafre's Ka statue, who seems to be looking out into infinity. This guy seems to be focusing on something specific. And again, if you think of the fact that he's probably a warrior of some kind, holding a spear in his hand, it would make sense that he is then engaging with his environment, with his surroundings, perhaps preparing for battle of some sort. Uh, so that sense of his physical purpose, his, his presence in the here and now, is underscored by this kind of contrapposto pose and what it does to his gaze and his engagement with the space around him. Now, the other thing um, to keep in mind here is that uh, the figure in this sort of harmonious balanced contrapposto is also, as we saw already with the Critios boy, incredibly articulated in terms of his physical form. Look at that musculature. Look at those um, abdominal muscles, the, the, the quote-unquote six-pack that we see here. Uh, notice these ridiculous veins that we can see popping out of his forearms here and going down into his hands. Check out those kneecaps with those rippling, bulging muscles above uh, those very, very strong thighs, uh, and even the sort of differentiation of his calf muscles here. There's an incredible attention to that kind of physical prowess and, and physical beauty uh, that we see in those details, in those um, naturalistically observed details of the human body. But I think it's important to uh, note that this is a kind of ideal Probably you didn't have a lot of six foot eleven guys walking around with absolutely uh, in incredible bodies of this sort. So in fact, what we're seeing here is a kind of bringing together of naturalistic detail, observed um, um, elements of the human body with a kind of ideal form. In fact, Polycletos wrote down uh, a sort of treatise on how to create sculptures, and he developed what we know of as a canon of proportion. Now, if you recall, our ancient Egyptian friends had a canon of proportion as well, based on the sort of scale of the fist, according to which each part of the body would be measured off uh, by that sort of abstract uh, um, amount or quantity uh, of the fist, that length. But it's interesting because I think Polycletos' canon of proportion is, uh, though it is also a system by which you can create a kind of underlying logic, it is based on observation. So instead of saying the foot needs to be X number of fists in length and the thigh has to be X number of fists in length, what Polycletos writes down is a set of proportions or relations. So um, the head should be in proportion to the body about one to eight. So the length of the head from the top of the head to the base of the chin uh, should be the same as, you know, if you times that by eight, that gives you the, the height of the figure as a whole. Likewise, the length of the finger to the hand, the hand to the forearm, uh, the foot to the, to, the, to the leg. All of these kinds of internal proportions were established by Polycletos as a way of kind of uh, articulating this ideal form. But again, based on kind of his observation uh, of the natural world, of, of, of nat natural figures, uh, as he tried to uh, discover that underlying logic of, of nature through perfect human forms. And that, you know, again, is a really different way of thinking about how you construct a canon of proportion as opposed to imposing it by a sort of, a, a sort of arbitrary quantity or distance. Now Polycletus is really trying to use his observations of nature as the basis from which to come up with this kind of set of ideal proportions for the human body. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So this is a uh, sort of articulate, really articulates, I think, the classical ideal, this idea of uh, reaching a kind of perfection, a kind of ideal through the development of uh, close visual uh, observation of the natural world. So naturalism paired with idealism. <laughs>
Now, I mentioned that this original was probably a bronze statue, uh, and we actually have some that have survived from the, the Greek period. Uh, most of them don't because bronze is a really expensive material, and so oftentimes it was melted down in later eras uh, so that um, people could use that material for, you know, munitions, um, armaments, armor, that kind of thing. So very, very few survive. One example that we have is this so-called Riace warrior. Now, Riace was a place on the uh, Italian coastline, but again, one of these Greek colonies there. And apparently, there were a bunch of statues uh, in bronze on board a ship that sank right off the coast of Riace, off the coast of Italy, that were recovered kind of accidentally by a swimmer there uh, some number of years ago. Uh, they've since been um, unearthed from the sand and the sort of uh, seabed uh, and uh, cleaned and restored. And you can see an example here with the Riace Warrior A. The date of this is probably about 460 or 450, so right around the time that Polykleidos was working on his uh, Doriferos or spear bearer figure. And you can see that the pose is very, very similar uh, in both of these figures. The height, the size, also uh, quite large, six foot nine for the Riace Warrior. It's known as Riace Warrior A because I think there were three such figures found there, A, B, and C. So again, contrapposto stance, weight heavily on that back leg, uh, balanced in this kind of um, dynamic symmetry or, or harmony with an active leg on the other side that probably held again a spear of some sort, a relaxed leg paired with a relaxed arm, and the shift in the whole body that results with the, the turning of the head and the really focused gaze. And here you can see the way that those sort of um, ins, inset eyes create a sense of, of really um, clear focus to that gaze. Uh, I'm going to post a little video about how these bronze statues were made to Blackboard because it's super interesting. They used a, something called the last, lost wax technique, where you would build up a kind of model, cover it with wax, uh, cover its exterior, and then pour molten um, bronze into uh, strategic holes that would then melt away the interior wax and uh, voila, leave you with the, uh, the form that you had cast uh, in your model, replacing the wax that had, was then, you know, allowed to leak out from the bottom from additional holes. So a really, really um, complicated and very, in many cases, dangerous technique to create these very large statues. Now you might wonder why go to the effort of creating bronze statues. Marble was plentiful in all of those mountains of Greece, uh, and certainly was easy to use and to 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 work with. Uh, well, one of the things I think that's really uh, worth noting is the what you can do with a bronze freestanding figure that's a lot harder to achieve with uh, marble. These bronze statues were hollow on the inside, which means that though they are heavy, they are not solid in the way that uh, um, these kind of carved subtractive uh, marble statues were. That meant that they needed less support. So you can see here with the Doriferous, that in order to balance this figure so it doesn't fall over on itself, uh, there's a kind of post here, maybe supposed to look like a tree trunk or something like that, to help support the leg and the body weight. Similarly, the arm here has been uh, restored with a little uh, marble uh, support there, so that it, at the very weak point of the wrist, uh, this arm won't fall off. None of that is necessary with the bronze, as you can see, because it is uh, both a very, very, um, uh, tensilely strong material, but also relatively light, which gives you an incredible flexibility. Look at what you can do. Oh, well, here you can see, sorry, uh, uh, another vase or vessel that's been painted, and you can see one of these bronze foundries. So already you can get the sense that around 500 BCE that there were really active workshops where figures, freestanding figures, were being made, head not yet attached to this statue, by uh, active craftsmen. This might be the sort of overseer, the head artist, who is watching and, and uh, making sure that his workers here are uh, creating that, you know, getting that bronze up to the proper temperature and molding it properly to create elements that would then be combined into a single sculpture. But look what you can do. I mean, even here you can see that the pose of this figure is so much freer, so much more uh, dramatic and sort of extroverted than the figures that we might have seen in other periods in harder stones and heavier stones. 
Uh, one good example of this that we find here is a figure that we, we're not quite sure what the identity of this figure is. Maybe it's Poseidon or Zeus. It also could be a warrior because, again, we don't have any of those kind of you know, identifying attributes that would let us know exactly the identity of the figure. But uh, clearly in action, right, you can see that the hand is pulled back, probably about to throw a spear of some kind. The front arm is, is uh, straight out front to provide that sort of ballast or balance for the figure as he gets ready to uh, throw that spear to build up that sort of strength or energy to throw. Notice the incredible active pose of the body. There's a real sense of this body moving out from its center. It's so flexible, so uh, able to uh, be captured in the sort of midst of action here. Incredibly free projection into space here, not limited by a block of stone or marble. And this is, I think, one of the great advantages of bronze and one of the reasons that uh, both in the uh, end of the archaic period into the classical period, period we see so much use of this or there's so much evidence of use of this for sculptures because it really did uh, provide artists the ability to create these incredibly naturalistic, active figures who seem to be involved in the world around them. And again, that's exactly in keeping with what we've seen the ancient Greeks attempting to achieve in their art and indeed in their culture. Okay, so we're going to wrap up there for today. We're going to pick up with uh, classical architecture and architectural sculpture when we come back to class on Monday. March 11th. If you have any questions at all, if anything sort of pops up for you, feel free to, to uh, send me a quick email uh, and we can also uh, answer questions in class on Monday before we get started with architecture about any of the, the images or the content that we've talked about here today. Okay, thank you so much uh, and thank you again for your patience with all of these interruptions to our regular class schedule. I really appreciate it. Okay, I will see you on Monday.